Stand easy, internet warriors. You're watching Woodby Productions' interview series highlighting Minnesota filmmaker Peter Hurd and his motion picture, The Control Group. In last week's episode, we talked about the best way to distribute an indie movie to the masses. This week, we learned the importance of saving you some of your budget for business and legal expenses. Oh, don't you roll your eyes at me. This is interesting and important. Uh, lots of things. Um, yeah, legal, what you would call like your soft costs, your paper costs. That's something a lot of indie filmmakers don't think about. They think about the things that are going to end up on screen. And if you're shooting very, very low budget, micro budget, if you're shooting with your friends or whatever, you don't need to worry about that stuff. At the same time, your film's probably not ever going to be distributed professionally unless you do it yourself. So, uh, but if you're doing a more professional production, your, your soft costs, your paper costs are going to eat up a lot of money. There's little things from opening LLCs, copywriting the script, you know, that's 30, $50 fees at a time, but hiring a lawyer, you know, that's going to be five, ten thousand $10,000 at least, maybe more depending on what you need. And if you're raising money from investors and you need to do it legally, you're going to need to put together a private placement memorandum, which is basically just a gigantic, complicated contract for raising money. And it costs a lot of money to, to have a lawyer put that together, about $10,000. Um, you're going to need insurance. That's another thing people don't think about. Um, and, you know, not just health insurance for your actors and your crew, because um, it's not if someone gets hurt on set, it's when someone gets hurt on set. Um, you're going to need unemployment insurance, all of that. Um, you need to hire a payroll company, and that's usually they take a percentage off of whatever amount of money they're transferring. So if it's a 1% uh, fee that they take, that means your budget is going up 1% for your production costs. So you need to, to, um, to plan for that. So yeah, th those soft costs can eat up a lot of money that you're not gonna be expecting. So you definitely need to plan for that. No, Writers Guild, I did not register the script with. Um, as far as legal protection, copyright is stronger for that, and it was sufficient. The only reason to register a script with the Guild um, is if you're trying to be become a member of it or you need to get health insurance from them, and that's only if you're a member. That's the only real advantage, and you need to have a lot of scripts before that's possible. So for an indie filmmaker, a lot of people like to submit to WGA just to make it sound official. It's just more expensive, and it leaves you less legal protection. So I would recommend just copyright it and worry about WGA when you sell to, you know, a major studio. Uh, just under a million. Couldn't give it to, you, to, to a penny, but just under a million. We raised enough money to get the film shot thinking that we could then raise money later for post-production this is actually a very important lesson for indie filmmakers don't do that it's really bad it's a really bad idea and i'll tell you why if your film has not been shot yet if you just have a script if you just have a poster whatever you can kind of sell the sizzle of the movie if your movie's 100% done, your sound's done, effects done, and everything, then you have a whole steak, and you can sell that to a distributor. Everybody likes steak. If you have a half-finished movie, it's kind of like trying to sell someone a steak in a slaughterhouse. You know, you're seeing half of the movie, and it no movie looks good when it's just a rough cut, and you don't have effects, and you don't have sound. And I think that was something that held us back for a while, was trying to raise funds with an unfinished cut like that. In retrospect, I think it it hurt some opportunities. I think, you know, people who know post-production know they can see how your film's going to look, but distributors really can't. They're used to seeing finished films or just scripts. They're not used to seeing half-finished films, especially 
if it's a distributor or a sales agent that is not also a producer, which a lot of them in the indie world are not, they don't, they can't really see it. And even if they are production companies, they can't see your vision for the film. So if there's anything with elaborate effects or where sound and music are going to be really important, they're not going to see that. And you explaining it to them is not going to help. So I think the best bet, the best advice I would give as for when to raise funds, I mean, I have seen other indie producers advocate for raising funds on set. A lot of movies have been done that way. Um, the Crying Game was filmed like literally they were raising money shooting the next day with the money they raised and then having to raise more money to film for the next day. That was pretty much how it was. And that's how a lot of indie movies were. And that can work if you can get the money all the way through post-production. Cause sometimes if you're on set and you can get investors there and things are moving and happening, if you have any name actors that gets people excited. So that can be a good way to raise funds, but if it doesn't work out, you're kind of screwed. So I think the best way to do it, is to raise all or as much of the money as you possibly can before you're filming. And ideally, if you can, you want at least part of that money to come from a distributor or from a sales agent that's going to be releasing your film in the end. That's a tall order for indie filmmakers, especially if you're a first-time filmmaker. It's probably not going to happen. But if you can make that happen, you're going to be a lot better off. Most indie distributors, especially people doing low-budget horror, indies under a million, first-time features, straight-to-DVD, that sort of, that world of filmmaking, they're surviving off of volume. You know, they don't, companies like that don't have hits. They don't have successful movies. They don't have one movie that really breaks out. They have programmers. They work by, they have a certain type of movie, and they give Redbox that movie every week or every month or whatever and same with prime and itunes they work by consistently giving them a lot of the same type of movie so if you if they don't have a lot of skin in the game on your film if you're just another film they picked up after it was done it can be very very hard to break out it can be very hard for them to really have the motivation to push your film above all the others and if you're filming for under a million dollars the production quality the names it's just not going to be enough you know there's not enough money at that level to really put it ahead of the pack so if you can find a way to give a distributor or a sales agent somehow involved in your film even if it's like a negative pickup where they pay a portion of the budget when the film is done and delivered to them that's going to give them skin in the game because they have money that they need to make back so that's going to push them so if you can raise money from distributors that's the best way to go. But again, that's, that's hard, probably hard to do until your second feature. I had to open two limited liability companies. Well, I already had point and shoot productions. I already had open as an LLC. Um, legally speaking, it's best to open one company for your production company and then another for each film is typically how it's done. So I did an LLC for the production company and then just the control group LLC. And the reason you do that is so you can have, well, a couple of reasons, main reason. So you can have a separate bank account. That's only ever going to have the money for the investors in that film. So when they give you money, it's all going into one account coming out of one account. And then when there are returns later, it can all go into that same account. And there's some other reasons for it. Um, when you work with um, unions or guilds, this wasn't applicable to the control group, but sometimes you might have to be signatory to a guild or a union and not want to be signatory to them in the future. So you can open one company for a film that will be signatory to a guild. Because if you work with SAG, Screen Actors Guild, anything like that, it, you sign a contract with them, you're a SAG signified producer for life. But if you use a different LLC, you're not liable to that as much. So a lot of people do it as a, as a way of getting around things. And then if there's lawsuits, whatever, um, then the LLC for that film is affected and it won't necessarily affect any other films that your production company is doing.
Thanks for tuning in. Join us next week when we take a stab at horror as a genre.